guys, it's Hannah and this is Bookworms Talk and today I'm going to talk about The Fault in Our Stars by John Green. Let me start off this by saying just a couple words that come to mind about how fantastical this book is. It, it's just, it's stunning, it's brilliant, it's heartbreaking. I've decided that in the dictionary next to the definition of perfect is a picture of The Fault in Our Stars with a 3D fold of John Green's face. John Green is basically the next supreme. It just, it astounds me that John can handle such a dark subject as cancer and do it with such wit and zeal and there's just this big theme of tragedy. We know this isn't going to end well because I'm actually going to jump into summary with that cute right here. Um, non-spoilers first, if you're not familiar with my channel, I do a non-spoiler section of describing kind of the synopsis without giving you big like plot giveaway things and then I talk most of the video about the individual little niches and stuff and things that happened, things I loved and cried about, which yeah, I cried a lot in this. But first I'm going to give you a quick little non-spoiler section. So this book follows our protagonist, Hazel Grace, and she was diagnosed with cancer and not that I have a possibility of recovering. No, no, it was, it was terminal from the get-go. She then goes to this support group where she meets Augustus Waters, who is not really a regular there. He just went there to support his friend Isaac. And from that point on, it kind of rewrites where Hazel's story was going. And it's just stunning. And it's funny. That is something that I cannot stress enough. When I tell people I'm laughing so hard, oh my god, what is air? And they're shocked by that because they think it's depressing. And I don't necessarily think this book is depressing. I mean, at the end, yes, you are depressed after, this, after reading this book. I mean, it's such a ride. But I wouldn't say while reading this book, it's just depressing. That's not at all. It's not giving it enough credit. We have all these really amazing existential, I hope I'm saying that right, or I sound really stupid, kind of ideas that are brought up all the way throughout this book, mostly on Augustus Waters' part. I can't even say it enough, John Green is brilliant, and you really need to pick this up. So now I'm going to talk about the spoilers because I have a lot to say and talk about and laugh about and cry about, I'm sure will happen. So for those of you who have not read this, I would go away now and I will see you later when you have read it. A little forewarning that if you do continue to watch, I was personally spoiled, and not that it ruined it for me by any means, but it would have been even better if I didn't know the ending, so I seriously, don't watch it if you haven't read it, okay? Okay. You'll get the later. I loved Hazel's and Gus's conversations, like the back and forth and the banter and the funniness, and they're both so perfectly weird, and I love them. And I loved when we interacted with the parents as well, like they were each characters too, and I feel like the parents so often fade into the background of like these, I guess, aimed at young adult kind of audience type books, but they were their own people too, which I loved. And I loved that she was best friends with her mother and I felt like I knew them and I was so attached to her father, oh my god. And just each of these characters are so individualized. I really especially love this part when Hazel was describing herself as a grenade and it was just, I need to think of a better word than perfect because just this whole book I feel like was so damn near perfect. But I just, I loved this. I'm a grenade and at some point I'm going to blow up and I would like to minimize the casualties, okay? And then later on, about a page later, she said when she was thinking about how she can't be with Gus, um, I loved this paragraph. Hand actions, don't know why it's happening. To be with him was to hurt him, inevitably. And that's what I'd felt as he'd reached for me. I'd felt as though I were committing an act of violence against him because I was. I really loved, and I, I have to mention this because it was one of my favorite parts, and I fall for this in any book that I read, when they were reading to each other, and then there was this one specific time after the whole swing set incident, oh my god, which I have to quote right after this, um, where he was reading an imperial affliction to her, and then she had this beautiful thought, and it's quite a famous quote from this book. As he read, I fell in love the way you fall asleep, slowly, and then all at once. Oh my god, and then the swing set thing that I was talking about that had me rolling in laughter in laughter. It's a thing you can roll in now. Headline, he asked. Swing set needs home, I said. Desperately lonely swing set needs loving home, he said. Lonely, vaguely pedophilic swing set seeks the butts of children, I said. <laughs> so when we finally got the Caroline situation explained to us, I was like, okay, this answers the questions, because I knew the end of the book before he, I knew he died. I knew it, all right? I was like, does he, is he a masochist or something? Because he just falls in love with terminally ill girls that will die, will die. Does he get kicked out? I don't understand. I don't know if it was the cancer, just like how they don't really know if she was just like that beforehand or if it was the cancer or if the cancer made it worse and she always was a bitch. But he did it so delicately so that he, I, I wasn't put off by that. It was just him explaining his experience with her. If you guys are new to my channel, you may not know this about me, but I am a sucker for reoccurring quotes and reoccurring themes, and just this especially, the reoccurrence of the phrase, 
The world is not a wish-granting factory. First we hear it from Hazel, and it's a mental thing with Hazel. She doesn't verbally say it, if I remember correctly, and I'm pretty sure I'm right on this. And then later on in the book, like maybe a couple chapters later, we actually hear Augustus verbally say it. And then it just, it made me love more that these characters had that kind of like connection and just deeper level of understanding of each other and their situation because they related like nobody else could relate. So then they're in Amsterdam and just, oh my god, the vividity, is that how you, the vividity, it's a, like an anemonemony, um, the vividity of Amsterdam and just the flowers and the imagery and the beautifulness and ugh, so good. But then when they went to go see Peter Van Houston, that's how you say his name, that's how I'm gonna say his name. I just, oh my god, I was really, really tired when I was reading that part and I'm like, I'm not reading this right. That's not how it's going. I need to wake up and read it again. And it still was the exact same. And so I'm just like, he's such an ass. But I just loved how when they were walking away, one, how Hazel handled the conversation, um, that was great. But then when they were walking away, Augustus said, you know what? No, I'm gonna write you an epilogue. It's gonna be better than anything that guy could write because his brain is like Swiss cheese. And I just loved Augustus for that because he always tries to do more for her. I am not even gonna get into that yet. Tears are coming. And then they went to the Frank Museum and then they kissed and there was no Velveeta cheese in the fact that the people clapped because it's a different culture, one, and two, John Green cannot write with Velveeta cheese on the pencil. It doesn't happen. And then when they went back to the hotel early and they went to his room, Augustus was very hesitant and like stopped in the elevator and I'm just like, oh no. So then I thought maybe it was the cancer, but then it was just him kind of being self-conscious about his leg and lack thereof of leg. And I loved Hazel's response to this. And this is why I think they are so perfect, especially for each other. And then, You're so hot, I said, my hand still on his leg. I'm starting to think you have an amputee fetish, he answered, still kissing me. I laughed. I have an Augustus Waters fetish. And then the Venn diagram happened, okay, I have to take a second. When Augustus told Hazel that he still had cancer and that he took this PET scan and that he, he lit up like a Christmas tree. It's not fair, I said. It's just so goddamn unfair. The world, he said, is not a witch-granting factory. God, and this is the part that got me. I mean, I knew this was gonna happen. But then this especially hit me. I'll fight it. I'll fight it for you. Don't you worry about me, Hazel Grace. I'm okay. I'll find a way to hang around and annoy you for a long time. I made it a lot longer than I thought without crying. When he was just talking about it with her still in the same little bit. Some war, he said dismissively. What am I at war with? My cancer? And what is my cancer? My cancer is me. These tumors are made of me. They're made of me as surely as my brain and my heart are made of me. This is a civil war, Hazel Grace, with a predetermined winner. And then he went on to say, and this is just something with Augustus, he, he wanted to leave his mark and he wanted to leave his scar and be remembered and to have made a difference. And he just gets so hung up on that. And then the video games, which at first I didn't understand, but then I completely understood why they were there because he would just, you know, jump in front of the thing to save the kids. And it would be, they lived a minute longer. That's not a small thing. And he said, if you were to go to the specific museum, and hopefully someday you will, you will see a lot of paintings of dead people. You'd see Jesus on the cross and you'd see the dude getting stabbed in the neck. And you'd see people dying at sea and in battle and a parade of martyrs, but not one single cancer kid. Nobody biting the dust from the plague or smallpox or yellow fever or whatever because there is no glory in illness. There is no honor in dying of. This is probably one of my favorite paragraphs of the book and it, I cannot even describe it. I'm just going to read it. Sometimes it seems the universe wants to be noticed. That's what I believe. I believe the universe wants to be noticed. I think the universe is impossibly biased toward the consciousness and that rewards intelligence in part because the universe enjoys its elegance being observed. And who am I, living in the middle of history, to tell the universe that it, or my observation of it, is temporary? So then when um, Augustus really started getting sick and Isaac was there, and I love Isaac, I don't know if I've even said that enough, but I love him. He fumbled toward Gus's hand and only found his thigh. I'm taken, Gus said. I needed that. I needed the burst of funny. And I mean, John Green, in the simplest little ways, would end up making me just cry. When they ached, oh God, I'm gonna tear up. When they ached Monica's car, and then she took the picture, and I'm just thinking, this is gonna be the last, and then she said, that's the last picture I ever took of him. I, I actually did mark the conversation with the parents at dinner. Oh my God, Gus, it tastes like me, food, Gus. Yes, precisely. It tastes like food. Excellently prepared, but it does not taste, how do I put this delicately? Me. 
It does not taste like God himself cooked heaven into a series of five dishes which were then served to you accompanied by several luminous balls of fermented bubbly plasma while actual and literal flower petals floated down all around you in the canal side dinner table. Nicely phrased, Gus said. Gus's father. Our children are weird. My dad. Nicely phrased. So then when Gus just got mad again, um, she took him to the funky bone, she wheeled him there, and I have to read this part. We sat, Gus in the chair and me on the damp grass, as near as the funky bones as we could get in his chair. I pointed to the little kids gouting each other and to jump from ribcage to shoulder, and Gus answered just loud enough for me to hear over the den. Last time, I imagined myself as the kid. This time, the skeleton. And of course, I have to read this because it's one of the most famous quotes from this book. It seems like forever ago, like we'd had this brief but still infinite forever. Some infinities are bigger than other infinities. And again, with the reoccurring quote, that'll happen a couple more times, and I'll read them again, and I'll cry again. And I mean, Gus, just, he got bad. I mean, really, really bad towards the end. And you know, he said after a while, it's kid stuff, but I always thought my obituary would be on all the newspapers, and I'd have this story worth telling. I always had this secret suspicion that I was special. You are, I said. You know what I mean, though, he said. I did... I didn't know what he mean. I just didn't agree. I don't care if the New York Times writes an obituary for me. I just want you to write one. I told him. You say you're not special because the world doesn't know about you, but that's an insult to me. I know about you. I don't think I'm gonna make it to write your obituary, he said, instead of apologizing. I was so frustrated with him. I just want to be enough for you, but I can never be. But this is all you get. You and me and your family in this world and this is your life. I'm sorry if it sucks, but you're not going to be the first man on Mars and you're not going to be the NBA star and you're not going to hunt Nazis. I mean, look at yourself, Gus. He didn't respond. I didn't mean I started. Oh, he meant it. He interrupted. I started to apologize and he said, no, I'm sorry. You're right. Let's just play. So we played. And I guess now is a great time to add a funny part. Um, when all of his family was there and they were just swarming him and they were in, um, they wheeled into the backyard with him. And his sister said, I can only hope talking about her kids, they grow into the same kind of thoughtful, intelligent young man you've become. I resisted the urge to audibly gag. He's not that smart, I said to Julie. She's right. It's just the most really good looking people are stupid. So I exceed expectations. Right, it's primarily his hotness, I said. It can be sort of blinding, he said. It actually did blind our friend Isaac, I said. Terrible tragedy, that. But can I help my own deadly beauty? You cannot. It is my burden, this beautiful face. Not to mention your body. Seriously, don't even get me started on my hot bod. You won't- <laughs> you don't want to see me naked, Dave. Seeing me naked actually took Hazel's breath away. <laughs> And that was the break, because now the tears are going to resume. Um, the pre-funeral? In the literal heart of Jesus. Oh my god, Isaac's got me so bad. Augustus Waters talked so much, he'd interrupt you at his own funeral. And he was pretentious. Sweet Jesus Christ, that kid never took a piss without pondering the abundant metaphorical reconnaissance of human waste production, and he was vain. And I do not believe I have ever met a physically more attractive person who was more acutely aware of his own physical attractiveness. But I will say this. When the scientists of the future show up at my house with robot eyes and they tell me to try them on, I will tell the scientists to screw off because I do not want to see a world without him. And then Hazel is, let's just get through this, Hannah. My name is Hazel. Augustus Waters was the great star-crossed love of my life. Ours was an epic love story and I won't be able to get more than a sentence into this without disappearing into a puddle of tears. I know the feeling. Gus knew. Gus knows. I will not tell you our love story because like all real love stories, it will die with us as it should. I can't talk about our love story, so I will take you about. I will talk to you about math. I am not a mathematician, but I know this. There are infinite numbers between zero and one. There's point one and point one two and point one one two, and then infinite collections of others. Of course, there is a bigger infinite set of numbers between zero and two, or between zero and a million. Some infinities are bigger than other infinities. A writer we used to like taught us that. There are days, many of them, when I resent the size of my unbounded set. I want more numbers than I'm likely to get, but God, I want more numbers for Augustus Waters than he got. But Gus, my love, I cannot tell you how thankful I am for our little infinity. I wouldn't trade it for the world. You gave me forever with the numbered days, and I'm grateful. And then the very next sentence after that is Augustus Waters dies eight days after his pre-funeral, and I lost it all over again. And then there's this ER story, and okay, I think this might have been my favorite part in the book and the one that hurt the most. So she's going to the yard, ER her lungs are just filled with fluid and she can't breathe and it's awful. And then when you go to the hospital, they ask you to rate your pain 
on a scale from one to ten and she holds up nine fingers and the nurse comes to her after and says this. You know how I know you're a fighter? You called a ten a nine. But that wasn't quite right. I called it a nine because I was saving my ten. And here it was, the great and terrible tin slamming me again and again as I lay still and alone in my bed, staring at the ceiling, the waves tossing me against the rocks and pulling me back out to sea so they could launch me again into the jagged face of the cliff, leaving me floating face upon the water, undrowned. And then the fact that Peter Van Housten was there and it was because of Augustus, and I'm just like, even after all of this, Augustus still did one last thing for her. So then Hazel's with her dad and she, he's apologizing, he's saying, I'm sorry that Augustus died. And he said it's total bullshit, the whole thing, 80% survival rate and he's the 20% bullshit. He was such a bright kid, it's bullshit, I hate it, but it was such a privilege to love him, huh? It gives you an idea how I feel about you, he said. My old man, he always knew what to say. And then the Peter Van Housten thing, at first I thought the funeral was his way of paying respects or he felt guilty or something but then he showed up in the back of her car and he explains how his daughter was like Anna and that she died when she was very young I think it was six years old and I mean things fit together better and I felt like that part of the story was kind of tied so we found out that Augustus was you know writing this epilogue or something of the sort for Hazel and then she had this new goal to find it and then she thought oh my god it was with Peter Van Housten and so she emails his assistant whose name I cannot pronounce and then we have Augustus's letter that he sent because he wanted a bit he wanted to be able to write her eulogy but he just didn't have this perfect way of doing it and so he wanted Peter to do it and he's just like you need to do this one thing and I'm not even gonna read the entire thing because all of it is beautiful and you guys remember it clearly I'm sure because it's impossible to forget and I'm gonna go through a couple of my absolute favorite quotes from this book there are so many and I've said a couple of them during this, but any of the other ones that I haven't mentioned I'm going to mention right now. That's the thing about pain, Augustus said. It demands to be felt. So when he pulled out his cigarette and Hazel was completely insulted by this, and rightly so, and he explained, they don't kill you unless you light them. And I've never lit one. It's a metaphor, see? You put the killing thing right between your teeth, but you don't give it the power to do the killing. And then the okay conversation, how how Isaac's and Monica's was always okay, he said after forever, maybe okay will be our always. Okay, I said. This is easily one of the most inspirational books and one of those that is going to stick with me and 10 years from now I will still remember it. And I think that is a great accomplishment. I just cannot praise this book enough. I really hope that you guys enjoyed this. I, I cried my eyes out and I just, I want to know your favorite quotes from the book. If you could pick one, what would it be? I don't know if I could choose that. But I will see you guys later next time on Bookworms Talk, where I'll be reviewing God-Shaped Hole by Tiffany DeBartolo. So I'll see you guys later. Bye.